Part of our heart every year at this conference is to give all of our regular people who serve week in and week out uh, a little bit of a break uh, so that those who are normally up here singing can, can sit and can worship, participate, and those who are normally serving behind the scenes and doing everything, uh, that they can just experience God. And so this whole service is for you and for you to be able to connect with God. Well, tonight's gathering, is, as I said earlier, is all about preparing our hearts for the ministry year. We're obviously committed to preparing your hands and your head for the ministry year. Tomorrow, we're going to cover all that, so don't worry about it. Tomorrow, we're going to cover all the things you need to know, the information, the vision, the updates, the training that you need to serve on a City View team. We really want tomorrow to be fun, uh, to be an enjoyable time, and for us to connect with each other. And so, you know, our C3 conference called. We've been talking all month about joining the team and what has God called you to do and, and responding to God's calling. The second C is, is connected, that we are a family. We do this together. We don't do it in isolation. And this last C is commission, and we're going to do that on Sunday morning. So at the end of this conference, we're going to have time for everybody who's serving to stand, and we're going to pray for you and commission you to this new ministry year. So really, it's a, it's a full weekend package, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning. But tonight, tonight is about connecting with God, who is the source of everything we need to serve and the one for whom we serve. Tonight is about slowing down enough in your lives. And, you know, we have got six children. And this week, I'm sure, like for many of you, has been crazy. It's been busy. We've been getting things back to going, having the schedule, the routine. Had baseball practice last night. Got all this stuff that's filling up the calendar, everything going on. And I'm sure your life is the same way. But tonight is about slowing down enough to make sure that we hear God's voice, listen carefully, about the kinds of vessels that we need to be so that God can powerfully use us for his kingdom. What kind of vessels do we need to be so that God can powerfully use us for his kingdom? If we don't take time to purify our hearts and check our motives, we are likely to turn into the religious leaders that Jesus consistently rebuked in the Gospels. What's amazing to me is Jesus was so gracious, so gracious with sinners, so loving and patient with outcasts, but amazingly confrontational with those who prided themselves on being the religious elite. As I speak to the core of the City View family tonight, I'm speaking to our most committed volunteers, our most committed leaders, our most committed servants. And I want to remind us all that the Lord Jesus was the most harsh in his earthly ministry with the religious leaders of his day, the core of the church of his day, who did not practice what they taught. He called those kind of leaders... Hypocrites, a word he used often. Based on the Greek word for wearing a mask, Matthew 23 records Jesus' rebuke. Listen carefully. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated at the chair of Moses. Therefore, do what they tell you and observe it. But do not do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. Let me read that again. Jesus, speaking of the religious leaders of his day, said to the crowd, listen to what they say, but do not do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. We do not want to be hypocrites in our ministry work, do we? Do we? How do we avoid hypocrisy and the rebuke of our God and our Savior? There's two important steps I want to talk about tonight. First, we want to prayerfully and intentionally close the gap between what we teach 
and who we are. We want to minimize the gap. This is the pursuit of godly character, of integrity in our leadership. Christ-like character is essential for kingdom leaders. This is the pursuit of personal holiness in our lives. Listen to me, not the performance of holiness. Not the performance of holiness, but the pursuit of genuine holiness. Genuine holiness is defined by who we are when no one is looking. When we're not on the stage, when we're not in front of the kids' class, when we're not serving on hospitality team, when we're not working in the ministry with our name badge on, but it's just us and Jesus, who are we in that moment? And to minimize the gap, we want to close the space between who we are in public and what we teach as church leaders and who we are in private. And second, we want to acknowledge honestly the gaps that exist. We do not want to present ourselves as the heroes of every lesson we teach. We don't want to present ourselves as the hero of every story. Jesus is the hero, amen? Jesus is the hero. We want to honestly acknowledge where we fall short and where we need grace. This is an important part of the City View culture. So whether you're a small group leader or re-engaged leader or you are part of worship ministry or children's ministry, listen to me. It's very important that this is part of our culture. We do not pretend to be somebody we are not. We are honest about our brokenness. We are humble and honest about our sins because we all need grace. We all have shortcomings. I asked the Lord to help me lead this church from a place of vulnerability, to preach from the pulpit about my own struggles, my own brokenness, my own needs, because that's the culture we want to create here. And I'm not perfect at it. I can be tempted into presenting myself as more than I am. What I'm describing to you tonight, closing the gap between what we teach and who we are and acknowledging where those gaps exist, all of that is wrapped up in the biblical word holiness. Now, in my conviction, holiness is undervalued and underemphasized in American Christian culture today. And I think I understand why. There are two important streams pulling us away from biblical holiness. One is an unholy culture around us that makes us feel weird and out of place when we seek holiness. Many of us struggle to live for Christ when no one around us is living for Christ. We don't want to be the only one that hadn't seen that movie or hadn't listened to that song. We don't want to be identified as a bigot because we hold to the Christian sexual ethic. We don't want to be the only one who doesn't participate in heavy drinking and the after hours party after work. We don't want to seem weird and strange, and so we seek to fit in and to go along, and we struggle living a holy life in an unholy culture. But the other reason we struggle with this is because there is this legalistic Christian culture that makes holiness all about rules rather than the heart. Many of you are familiar with this tribe, having grown up around it. A culture where holiness is not about who you are on the inside. Holiness is not about who you are in private. Holiness is about all the rules that you keep on the outside. We don't see R-rated movies. We don't drink any alcohol. We don't wear shorts. On and on and on it goes. This legalistic culture makes holiness a checklist of things we perform for each other, but doesn't actually get to the motives of the heart. Many of you who have grown up in a church like that have reacted to that legalistic form of Christianity that puts your personal convictions on everybody else and focuses on rules that aren't in the scriptures as the definition of holiness. Now, why do I say all that? To say that these external tensions are real. This unholy culture around us, this legalistic tendency within the church that's possible, those battles are real. But I want to bring a bigger issue to you this evening. The greatest reason we struggle with holiness is not the world around us. Are you listening? It's not the unholy culture. It's not legalistic Christians. If we're listening to our Bibles, the greatest reason we struggle with holiness is because the natural desires of our hearts are not bent toward holiness. 
The natural desire of our hearts is not bent toward holiness. Even as Christians, we battle the flesh. There's a war going on inside of each one of us that we need to acknowledge and we need to fight together. And that is the battle between the spirit of the living God and your flesh. Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to read about this battle that we are all in the middle of. Starting in verse 13. Reading all the way down to verse 26. Galatians 5 starting in verse 13. You know, if we're going to read God's word, we've got to stand together. You thought I'd forget. I wouldn't forget. <laughs> Preaching on holiness, we've got to stand up. Here's what God's word says to us. Starting in verse 13. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. You can be seated. Tonight I want to talk about three things. The command to be holy. The connection between holiness and ministry. And an honest assessment of where we are. The command to be holy. The connection between holiness and ministry. And an honest assessment of where we are. Let's start with the command to be holy. We are commanded in Galatians 5 not to use the freedom that we have in Christ as an opportunity for our flesh. In other words, our freedom that Paul's been talking about earlier in this chapter, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, right? We have the spirit of freedom that lives within us. He says, you've been set free from the bondage that you were in. You've been set free from all these requirements of the law. You've been set free. But then he says, but be careful. Don't use that freedom that you've been given as permission to sin. Don't use that freedom as a covering for following your flesh. You see, our freedom in Christ is our freedom from the power of sin over our lives. Now that we have the blood of Jesus, now that we have the Spirit of God, we have what we need to walk in holiness that God commands. In verse 24, Paul is even stronger. Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. In other words, God's desire for his people is that they would not give in to the sinful desires of their flesh, but they would be holy. 
Holiness in the Bible starts with God. God is the standard for holiness in the Bible. Not any person, not me, not the elders, not the most famous Christian you've ever followed, not your famous author. The standard of holiness is God. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Three times he's holy, he is perfect in his holiness. Holiness in the Bible is defined as the absence of sin and the presence of goodness. God is perfectly holy in that he never sins, he never does anything unrighteous, and he is perfect in his goodness and his righteousness. To be holy in the Bible is to be set apart, to be unique, to be different. This is why God is ultimately holy. He is completely unique and different. He is set apart from his creation in all of his perfections. There is nothing in creation that compares to God. He alone is holy. The call to holiness in the Bible is the call for God's people to reflect the character of God in all that they do. In other words... We are holy, not when we are better than other people. We are holy when we are more like God. In our hearts, our minds, and our behaviors. This is why God says in Leviticus 11.45 to the people of Israel, For I am the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt to be your God, so you must be holy as I am holy. This is why Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.15 to the church. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. Now listen, this is not an Old Testament thing. I just read you a verse from the Old Testament, a verse from the New Testament, and it's the same message to God's people. Be holy as God is holy. Now we all feel tension in that, don't we? Because none of us is holy on our own. This is why we need a savior to rescue us. And so we say this every week at City View in all of our ministries. Jesus alone was perfectly holy and he came to rescue unholy people and to make us holy. But we are wrong, church, if we believe that Jesus saved us from sin so we could go back into our sin. We are wrong, church, if we think that Jesus saving us and the spirit filling us is so we could just keep on living the way we had been living. As Paul writes in Romans 6, 1, may it never be. Jesus saves us on the basis of his holiness so that we can actually pursue that holiness in our lives. This is not some just mystical spiritual reality. We say, yeah, we're holy in some kind of way that nobody really understands. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual holiness. We're talking about growing in our character and Christ's likeness over time to become more and more holy like Jesus is holy. Now that's what the Bible says to all Christians. But I want to ask the question, what's the connection between our holiness and ministry? Because we're here at a ministry conference. We're here at a ministry conference talking about ministry, learning how to do ministry. What's the connection between the two? This is really important and the heart of my message tonight. Our main passage tonight in Galatians 5 says, the spirit of God in us and our flesh are in a battle with each other. Now, does that surprise anybody in the room this morning, this this evening? No, we all know that, right? We all know that battle every single day. The scripture are just telling us what is obviously true. Paul says to us, walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. The implication is, if we are not walking by the Spirit, if we're not listening to the Spirit, if we're not being led by the Spirit, listen to me, then we will be walking in the flesh. We will be indulging the flesh. You see, a Christian can either walk by the Spirit or walk by the flesh. Those are the only two options. We're either going to walk by the Spirit or walk by the flesh. We can either be led by the Spirit or we can be led by the flesh. And the daily decisions that we make, men and women, are directly connected to our alignment with and our empowerment by the Holy Spirit for ministry. You see, what I want you to know at the beginning of this ministry year 
is that you do not want to do ministry without the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. This is why 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, the Bible says, do not quench the Spirit. This is why Ephesians 4, 30 says, do not grieve the Spirit. The point is this, when we walk in holiness, we're walking in step with the Spirit. The Spirit fills us, He leads us, He guides us, He empowers us for ministry. But when we walk in the flesh... We grieve the Spirit of God. We quench the Spirit's power in our lives. He's talking to Christians in this passage. This is not an evangelistic text. He is talking to Christians and he is saying, you are either going to walk by the flesh and you're going to quench the Spirit, or you're going to walk by the Spirit and you're going to be filled with Him for powerful ministry. You see, listen, you cannot do eternally fruitful ministry in the power of the flesh. Let me say that again. It is my deep conviction. You cannot do eternally fruitful ministry in the power of the flesh. Now, let me be clear. You can draw a crowd and you can build a church and you can run a program, but you will not bear eternal fruit. You can recruit a team. You can make it look good. You can make it sound good. You can do a lot of things that a lot of people will tell you is amazing ministry in the flesh. But what we have seen, have we not, time and time again, that ministry built on the flesh collapses. Ministry built on the flesh does not sustain. And ministry built on the flesh, listen to me, hurts people, wounds people. And so we want to go into this ministry year and we want to learn how can we be in step with the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, because we know that only the Spirit of God saves and transforms and draws and opens blind eyes and heals and convicts and frees people. Only God, not us. And so as you step into your new ministry year, your job, number one, your job, number one, is not to have all your handouts printed. Your job is not to have the whiteboard clean. Your job, number one, is to be in step with the Spirit. Your job, number one. And we cannot do that if we are indulging the flesh. Feeding the flesh and walking in the flesh is like putting a kink in a water hose. The water source is plentiful. There's plenty of water, right? The faucet is all the way on. But there's no water coming out of the hose. Because there's a kink in the hose that is keeping the water from flowing. That is what, that is what unrepentant sin does in the life of a believer. In the life of a ministry leader. It It's like a kink in the hose. It's quenching, biblical word, quenching the supernatural power of God flowing through you into the ministry you're doing. Saying, God, I I don't know why I'm not seeing transformation and change and power coming through. I'm doing this for you. Here's one of the things we just need to specifically pray about. God, is there something in my life where I'm indulging my flesh where I'm not in step with the Spirit, and it's quenching the Spirit's work in my life. And let me talk specifically about what's on my heart tonight pertaining to our holiness as the people of God, the City View family. I think in our rejection of legalism, we have lost much of the ability to be discerning and wise about what we put into our minds. Let's not be deceived here. What we watch and what we listen to and what we read shapes the way we think. And God's word is crystal clear in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. It's not that what we watch and read and listen to makes us unholy. 
we're already unholy. It doesn't make us unholy. It's that it feeds what's already in us. Those sinful desires that are already residing in your heart, the flesh. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6, 45? He said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, everything we do in ministry is coming out of the overflow of our hearts. But here's a new way to think about growing in discernment and wisdom on what we put into our minds. Is what I'm consuming, this is the question I want you to really wrestle with tonight. Is it feeding my flesh or helping me grow in the spirit? Is it helping me grow in the spirit or is it feeding my flesh? Let me give you a couple examples based on our passage in Galatians 5. Paul says that one of the works of the flesh is sexual immorality. Did you see that in front of the list? Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity. Now, he says this is already in our hearts. This is part of our sinful nature. This is part of our flesh. It's already there because we're sinners. But if we look at pornography, if we watch sexually explicit shows, we are feeding the flesh, aren't we? We are feeding the flesh. Listen to me. It's not that the pornography creates the lust in me. The lust is already there. The lust is already there. But the pornography is feeding it. It's feeding the flesh. And it just keeps growing. This is why what starts for a lot of people is soft porn turns into hard porn, turns into one night hookups with people from online conversations. Why? Because indulging the flesh just makes it keep growing and it wants more and it wants more. Now, removing porn from your life will not make lust go away because pornography didn't put it there. The lust was already there, but it will, listen to me, it will help you exercise self-control over that lust by the Spirit of God and minimize that impact on your life over time. Do you see the point that I'm making? You are either feeding that lust or you are starving that lust based on what you are putting in your mind. Now, many of us today as Christians will say, well, I don't want to have all these rules about what I can watch and can't watch and can't listen to and can't listen. I'm not saying that. I don't have a list of rules for you. I'm asking you, is what you're putting into your brain feeding your flesh or feeding the Spirit? Yes, sir. Come on now. Look at the word jealousy in the list of works of the flesh. The text also talks about envy. The heart that's discontented with what you have and desires to have what other people have. Jealousy is something that lives within all of our hearts. Amen? If you're not ever struggling with jealousy, you're lying. We all struggle with jealousy, right? It's within our hearts. But it's a stronger temptation for some of us than others. Jealousy is deadly. It kills friendships business partnerships, church fellowships, splitting up even families. Now think about the impact of jealousy on your heart. If you already struggle with jealousy, it's already in there. And you spend all of your time scrolling Instagram, all your time scrolling Facebook, looking at other people's lives. Now listen to me. It's not that social media is making you jealous. It's already in there. But it's feeding it. It's feeding that jealousy. Are you feeding it? Are we indulging that desire within our hearts to live somebody else's life because we're satisfied with our own life? You see, removing social media from your life won't take jealousy totally away. It was already there before social media showed up. You can still see your next door neighbor's car, right? Okay, that jealousy is not going away. But if you stop feeding it, if you stop feeding it, then that flesh is not going to dominate you. The spirit's going to control you. Are you being wise about what you're putting before your eyes? 
Are you being wise about what you're thinking about? Are you feeding the jealousy? Or are you killing it? What are you doing, Christian? Notice the phrases on their outburst of anger and strife. These are works of the flesh. Outburst of anger and strife. Now listen, nobody has to teach you how to get angry, right? If you doubt that, come to my house, see my children, right? I mean, they're born into the world with that capacity to get angry quickly, to have these amazing outbursts where they say hurtful things to other people, causes strife and division. Barry Nice full-time job is like restoring relationships in the family, right? Because of all this, you don't need to go to a class on how to get angry, how to cause strife, how to cause division. We all know how to do that. But once again, some of us are a little more tempted in this space. Some of us, our temperament, our personality kind of bends this way a little bit more. And so I just need you to think about it. If you already know that this is an area of struggle for you in your flesh, again, are you being discerning about what you're putting into your mind? Listen to me, listen to me. Do you think by sitting in front of the television and watching people have conflict and yell at each other day after day, hour after hour, do you think that's going to help you be more calm? Do you think that's going to help you be more peaceable? Are you feeding the flesh or are you feeding the spirit? Again, it's not that listening to other people is causing you to be angry. It's already in there. The anger's already in there. But if you're not careful, if you feed it, it'll just grow. It will just grow and it will consume you. We start to think it's morally acceptable and good to vent our anger at other people and be disrespectful and hateful in our speech. We become numb to the gracious, kind, gentle work of the Spirit and we indulge the works of the flesh. If angry outbursts and causing divisions are ongoing temptations for you, are you being wise about what you put in your mind? Is what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, and what I'm reading, is it indulging the flesh or is it feeding the spirit? You get my point through these three examples. You don't need to become legalistic. Do not leave this message tonight. Said Keith said we can't watch TV. That's not what I'm saying. (laughs) Don't leave this place and be like, the pastor said, I got to cancel Netflix. I'm sorry, baby. You can't have Instagram anymore. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not up here telling you what to do and not do. But I am saying to you, I'm afraid we're not being discerning. We need to grow in wisdom and discernment. You guys realize we have more content coming at us every day than any generation before us. And we have to realize that is impacting us. That what we spend our time reading, watching, listening to is either gonna help us walk in the spirit or walk according to the flesh. And here's my heart in all of this. I want you to walk in the spirit. Because I believe When we commit to growing in holiness together, we will see the power of God in our ministries and in our lives and our families in ways we have not seen. It's not that it wasn't there, but there was a kink in the hose. Are you hearing me? How then can we use tonight to make an honest assessment of our holiness? Our main passage lays out two contrasting visions of our lives. I do think it's really interesting. He uses two different words, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. The works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. We've put the two lists together for you tonight. For reflection, for prayer, for self-assessment, and and mostly for repentance. Repentance. For us to come to the Lord, myself included, and say, God, I have been feeding the flesh. I've been excusing sin. Verses 19 and 21 tells us the works of the flesh are obvious. Isn't that an interesting word, obvious? You already know what they are. 
I already know what they are in my life. You don't need a sermon. You know why you don't need a sermon? You know why you don't even need this message? It's because remember who he's talking to? He's talking to believers. And the spirit is in them. And he's saying to them, the works of the flesh are obvious. You know why? Because the spirit's already convicting you. If the spirit's not speaking to you and convicting you, you ought to be very concerned. And you need to get saved. I'm serious. I'm serious. If you are not a believer, you're not feeling any conviction. But if you are a believer, the Spirit is with you, and He's already convicting you. And that's why it's obvious. I can give you the list, but as you look, you already know what it is. I'm up here preaching, and the Spirit of God is already on you. He's already talking to you. He's already convicting you. It's obvious what you need to die to. It's obvious what you need to grow in. Because the Spirit is working. The works of the flesh are obvious, immorality, impurity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. The Spirit is convicting us and inviting us to change. Even now, He is calling you. Not because... He hates you or he's mad at you because he loves you and because he knows your holiness is for your own good. Even now, the Spirit is calling you to himself. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Compare yourself to the Savior who died for you. He is inviting you to live in step with the Spirit, to bear all the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, is it evident in your life? Would people look at your life and would they see love and joy? Where they see peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You say, oh, Keith, it's old-fashioned, out of date. This, listen, this is about what it means to be holy as a Christian. I don't care what the culture is doing. I don't care what your neighbor is doing. I don't care what your spouse is doing. What I'm saying to you is, is, is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ? Is your life marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? We need to work slowly through that list tonight and answer this question. Where am I walking according to the flesh and where am I walking according to the spirit? This message is not intended tonight to make you feel guilty for your sin. It is to inspire you toward holiness. Friends, listen, there is something better. There is something better. There is something better than indulging the flesh and living according to the world and running after addictions and doing all the stuff the world tells you to go after to thinking that sex and money and power and relationships and influence is going to make you happy because it won't. And so we run after all that stuff and I'm saying to you, listen, I'm not up here. I'm not mad at you and God's not mad at you. We're calling you to something greater, calling us to something higher, to holiness in our lives. Friends, the scripture is clear. Flee from sin. With all your strength, with all the strength of the Holy Spirit, flee from that and run to the God who loves you and saved you and he will forgive and he will fill you with his spirit. Here's the good news of 1 John 1, 9 and 10. Again, written to Christians. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. If we say, verse 10, we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. If you tonight read this list, you hear this message and you say, oh, I hope everybody else is listening. I don't have any unholiness in my life. Come on. Let's don't play games at church tonight. This is church family. We are here to do business with God. This is a safe place. This is a safe place for us as God's people to get our hearts right for the new ministry year. Did you hear what I just read in 1 John 1, 9 and 10? If we will confess our sins, we will receive tonight, tonight, right when we confess that cleansing power of Jesus. He will forgive all that stuff we've done, all that things that we've put in our minds that have gotten us distracted and we've fed the flesh. Jesus promises to forgive us and to wash us clean, but we got to confess it we got to come clean with God tonight and say, yes, this is what I've been doing. This is what's in my heart. And we need to ask God that he would take control, that he would fill us. God is here not to punish you. He loves you. 
He is here to fill you with joy, peace, love, patience in your heart. He is here and he wants to forgive you and wash you clean. Listen, he is that water that is coming. He's that reservoir of water that is endless, that wants to fill you and supply you with everything you need for the ministry year. But if you've got that kink in the hose, if you've got that kink in the hose, straighten that baby out tonight and say, Lord, I'm turning this over to you. I'm gonna stop doing the things in my life that are feeding my flesh, and you know what they are. I'm gonna stop that, and I'm gonna start doing the things that are gonna feed my walk with you, that are gonna feed my walk with the Holy Spirit, because I want your rushing power, your water to flow through my life, right? (laughs) Friends, he is here to renew you and to strengthen you and to fill you. Will you bow with me in prayer?